How many of you touched God last night? Seriously felt, how many seriously felt like you, you and heaven did some business? It's good. The week's not over. Every day is an opportunity to go deeper with God. And for those who are watching under the, from a distance, there's still time to come in. Amen? Remember, we, remember what the Lord said to us last night? He said he's finding every way. He's finding every way possible to speak to our hearts. Before you leave, God will speak in so many ways. You'll think, God, okay, I get it. I get it, Lord. You're speaking to me. Okay. So if that's you, take, take hope. You say, well, I haven't heard God yet and I'm really pushing in. Take hope. God will speak to you. Sometimes you can be so intense that you miss the gentle voice. You know, I remember being so intense, so intense praying. And the answer was right in front of me because I was so intense I couldn't see it. So don't stress out. Thank you, David. Bless you, sir. He who refreshes will himself be refreshed. So don't be intense. Tell your neighbor, don't be intense. Now say this to your neighbor. I'm so glad. I'm not like you. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not like you and you're so glad you're not like me it's okay not to, to to like yourself it's okay to be original God likes creating originals yeah I'm looking at a whole room of originals a smile go on I'm an original do you like my t-shirt? On the sixth day, God created Manchester. It's right there in the Bible. Okay, let's come around the word this morning. I said to Pastor Kwame, I don't need to speak this morning. He said, me neither. So I said, well, we're on. We're going to speak. Oh, we should just let God and take every session. <laughs> Look at his face. Everybody say with me, the journey of pursuit. You know, if you're going to go beyond the walls, it's a journey. What you can't climb today, you'll climb tomorrow. What you, don't, what you can't overcome today, you'll overcome tomorrow. Amen? But we start today, as we heard yesterday, Pastor Kwame tell us the importance of today. We start today, we start going beyond the wall today in our hearts and our minds. Yeah, come on. You've just been really, really responsive in the worship, so stay awake now. I know it's hot. If you fall asleep, I'll fall asleep. Okay? So help me and I'll help you. If you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 9. And I want you to see your journey in the context of what I now read to you. We're going beyond the walls. Paul, or his name was Saul before he was called Paul. There was, he was trapped in a wall called Judaism. And God wanted to put him on a journey that would take him beyond his tradition, his knowledge, his limitations, and his containment. Because, you know, culture can contain us. Traditions limit us. And these are the things that can Stop us going beyond the wall. And Paul is a great example of how God, when God gets hold of your life, you have to go through certain things to go beyond the wall. Paul broke, not only did he destroy his wall, he broke through every wall. 
Paul was unstoppable. That's you and me. We can be unstoppable. We can. So let's read this chapter. I'm going to, in my Bible, remember what I told you yesterday? The verses change from different Bibles. I'm starting at verse 3 and I'm going to verse 18. In your Bible, it could be 21 starting at verse 5. I'll let you work that out. As I neared Damascus, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, everyone say suddenly. suddenly. Get ready for some suddenlies in your, in your life. I say get ready for a suddenly. You're going to do one thing and then suddenly something happens and changes the whole course. I love, God is the God of suddenlies. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell on the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you keep persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. Everyone say Ananias. Ananias. I'm looking at a room full of Ananiases here this morning. The Lord called to him in a vision. Maybe last night some of you had a vision last night. Maybe the Lord called to you after that impartation. I know our children, that was my prayer. That God would give him dreams and visions so that they would know the future. As, they, as a young child growing up, they would already know their future. Amen? And the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying in a vision. He has seen the man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, An Lord, Ananias answered, I don't, it's like Ananias is saying, Lord, have you not read Sky News? Did you not see the Sky News report this morning? There's a guy in town who's persecuting everybody. Lord, he's bad for business. And Lord's saying, it's okay. I'm on the scene. I know what's happened. He's my chosen instrument. He's going to be there. I'm doing a new work in his life. I'm, I'm going to take him beyond the walls. But Ananias, I need to take you beyond your walls. I need to take you beyond your walls of fear. Just because you hear some bad things, Ananias, you're now hesitant about going and doing what I ask. But it's okay, Ananias. I'm ahead of you. I've gone before you. I've given you the word. Go and do what I ask you. Because there's somebody out there who needs your help. There's somebody out there who's blind. So Ananias gathers the courage. And the rest of the story tells us, and let's pick it up. Verse 17 in my Bible. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered in. Everyone say, enter the house and enter the house and enter in. And he placed his hands on Saul. Yeah? Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately, how many of you know, God is the God of suddenly, God is the God of immediately. So where, there's an, where there is a suddenly, there is an immediately. Immediately, you can be set free today. Immediately, you can see Immediately you can receive. From a suddenly comes an immediately. He. It only takes God to step into the scene. And a suddenly becomes an immediately. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. Hey. How amazing is that? I said how amazing is that? A guy goes in, prays for him, and he begins to see. It's like, 
Ananias looks at God and says, hey, do you want me to go anywhere else? Can I pray for anybody else? This thing works. All over the world, there are millions and millions of people making a journey in the wrong direction. Today you got up and as you walked across to this hall, you bypassed people who were making a journey in a completely different direction. Hello? People in the street you passed. They're going in a different direction than you. You was coming to the house of the Lord. They were going to work. They were going doing other things. But many, many people are going in the wrong direction. And God has to intervene sovereignly in the lives of people so he can turn them around suddenly and bring them on the path of what he planned for them. And you and I was one of those people. Hello? You and I was one of those people. You think, well, I grew up in church. There's no such thing as growing up in church. I didn't grow up in church. I went to church. I didn't grow up in church, but I know what we mean by that. We grow up as human beings. We grow up in many places. We grow up in school. We grow up in the home. We grow up in the street. We grow up in music. We grow up in relationships. We grow up in many, many areas of life. And those things can set us on the wrong path. Is that not true? If you've, ever chosen a, if you've ever chosen a bad girlfriend or a bad boyfriend, you know what I mean. Or whether a girlfriend chose you as a bad partner or a boyfriend chose you as a bad partner, you'll know. But every journey is a destiny. It's going somewhere. It's leading to some place. This is why you cannot just walk and do your own thing, young people. It's going somewhere. And then suddenly the consequences will become immediate. If you keep doing things, if you, example, if you keep smoking or taking drugs, eventually there's going to be a suddenly. When the ambulance is coming and the flashing lights, then you'll realize that was now my suddenly is coming. And immediately you're going to have to be taken to the hospital. Why? Because all this time was spent doing the wrong thing. And now the consequences of that thing is going to bring on your life a suddenly. Yes, we all know this. But we never anticipate the day when suddenly comes. We think we've got a few more years we think we've got a few more hours. We don't know how long we've got. So we need to make wise decisions. Amen? You know, there's many, many people with incredible zeal. You only have to look at ISIS. Incredible zeal. They will do amazing things for their so-called religion. But you know, zeal is not proof that you know God. It's not. But zeal is the fruit of something that's captured a hold of a person's life and he's now driving him in a direction. Come on, think about this. You know, when I was young, I had a zeal to serve the Lord. I've still got a zeal to serve the Lord. And I didn't tell my wife, but I went for an interview to be a missionary to Germany. Can you imagine not telling your wife? So I went for the interview and I'm thinking, God, you just know I want to serve you. You'll, you'll convince me, wife. Can you imagine me going home and saying, honey, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is we're going to Germany. The bad news is you're leaving your mother behind. And I just had this zeal to go to Germany, to, to be a missionary. And then I'm waiting, I'm saying, God, you know I want to be a missionary in Germany. You know I want to speak German. You know I want to reach the German people. 
Lord, you know they need saving. <laughs> so I went for the interview. And then I got a letter. Dear sir, we are sorry to inform you that you did not fulfill the criteria. What? I'm your greatest option. That's it. Germany's lost. It's true. Now I look back and I think, what would have happened if I would have gone home and said to my wife and the children, we're going to Germany. It's not the same as we're going to Disneyland. <laughs> it's not the same. Somehow, I don't think they're going to buy that one. And God says, Tony, you have a desire to serve me, but you don't know me yet. And if you don't watch out, if I let you go to Germany, there's going to be a suddenly in your marriage <laughs> and in your family. But I said, Lord, I still, and then I applied to go to Australia. <laughs> I had the zeal to go. And the Lord says, no, I've got this beautiful place for you. What? Manchester. <laughs> but it rains there. They don't speak German there. There's no Bondi Beach there. He says, no, you're absolutely right, but I'm there. So if you get exotic places, good luck. I got Manchester. So when I wear a t-shirt like this, this is proof to me that I am where I'm supposed to be. Because I try to get out of Manchester. But God wants me for Manchester, just like he wants you in your town, your city, your nation. I laugh because zeal alone is dangerous. Zeal alone. So do not just say, well, I have passion, Lord. That's my proof. I love you. You need wisdom. You need understanding. You need knowledge. So if you get the call... To come to Manchester, I know you're hearing God. <laughs> it's not enough. Zeal is not enough to know, to say that you love God. It's not enough to be led just by zeal. It's a very dangerous thing because zeal can be an emotional thing. It's true. Come on, tell your neighbor. Come on, tell, tell your neighbor. Zeal can be emotion only. And you know, we're young people. We have a lot of emotion. We need more than zeal. We need understanding. We need wisdom. Amen. Come on. So let's go to, back to Acts. In verse 3, in my Bible, it says, Suddenly, as I... As he heard Damascus, uh, so as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. You see, when you're going to go beyond the wall, there needs to be sight, there needs to be light and sound flowing through your life. Write this down, it's going to help you. Some people saw the light but didn't hear the sound. Some people hear the sound but never hear the light. You see, many people receive the light of salvation. Now hear what I'm saying now. Many people get born again. They see the light. But then they do not hear the voice later on. They do not know how to hear the voice of God for their life. So this is what happens they stay religious at the cross, but they never move beyond the cross. Because there's no light. Listen, there is light and sound to bring you to the cross. That's one dimension. But then you need light and sound to take you beyond the cross so that you can begin to understand the depths of Christ. Hello, young people. Paul needed this. This is one of his walls he had to overcome. Now he was being guided by a light he'd never seen before. Now he's being guided by a voice he's never heard before. Because before that, Paul was just working on zeal. 
And his zeal was persecuting people, just like so many other religions can do today. They can persecute people by their zeal. But now the voice and the light is beginning to guide his, his, his uh, life. And now for the first time, Paul hears heaven speak to him. Paul, Paul or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice he didn't say why are you persecuting Christians. He said, why are you persecuting me? He who touches them touches me. Because he's identifying we are all one. So for the first time, Paul has to be led by a voice he's never heard before. And he has to be guided by a light he's never seen before. And my friends, this is the beginning of our journey of going beyond the wall. You have to hear a voice and see a light you've never got used to before. You have to be trained by the Holy Ghost. Yes, there is a journey for you. But unless you can hear the, light, uh, hear the voice and see the light continuously in your life. You see, you might say to me, well, explain what you mean by seeing the light. Well, if the word, let's just read this scripture. It's from Psalm 119, verse 105. I will read it. You just listen. Your word is a lamp to my feet and it's a light to my path. So when the word comes, it lights up your path. So first of all, you heard the word and the word became a light. Which then guides your path so that you can be led in a direction so you can go beyond your wall. So it's important that we have the word speaking to us on a daily basis. Now remember, the word is not just black and white type in a book. The word that speaks to us is a person. Do you remember what I said yesterday? Hello from the other side. There's a voice that speaks to us. And then it witnesses inside your spirit. And that's what we call deep calls to deep. Yes. And as deep calls to deep, as you, your deep waters call out to the Holy Spirit in the word, the Holy Spirit and his word begins to call out to you. And deep calls to deep. Yes? And when you catch it in your spirit, there's an illumination. The room lights up. And now you know how to navigate your way in life. Hello? Because it's truth that's guiding us, not emotions. Remember, zeal will take us in many places. It tried to take me to Germany. I've never, ever lost my love for Germany. Never lost my love. But God says it's not for you. But you can go back there, you can visit. Now I have good Swiss and good German friends. And God's given me a part of what I thought I would never have. So I enjoy it when I go to Switzerland and Germany. I know Swiss, Switzerland is Switzerland, but there's Swiss German speaking people. So I feel like I'm next to Germany. But there's something in my heart. It's never left me. I have something in my heart for Brazil. But God says, Man from Manchester, you will go to the nations. There has to be a base in your life. So then he says this in... Proverbs 4.12, again, I will read it to you. You just listen. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. So he says, hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. So when the word and the light begin to light up your path, hold on to instruction. Young people, I was young once, and no, you don't think that's ever true, but it was. I was once your age. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> but you're not the only teenagers to have ever lived on planet Earth. We was once teenagers. And you know, teenagers don't like advice. You know why? Because I've got zeal, I've got strength, I've got knowledge. I'll work it out on my own way. Hello, is there anybody out there? Of course. It's all part of growing up. 
But every now and then you have to be guided by the voice and the light. The Lord says, there will be a suddenly if you don't listen. Your suddenly will become an immediately if you do not listen. So please pay attention to what God is trying to speak to us today. So we have to go through the cross, amen? We have to be taken through the cross, not just to the cross, but beyond the cross. Because yesterday I used the illustration, all the riches of the fullness are beyond the cross. Hello? All the riches of the fullness. So he says in verse 6 of, of uh, Acts, chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now here's the hard part for most Christians, to be told what to do. It's true. Most Christians do not like to be told what to do. Well, let's change the phrase. No one's trying to tell you what to do. We're trying to encourage you to do the right thing. There's a difference. I'm not saying to these guys here, you do this, you do that, you do this. That's not what God's saying. But through wisdom, we're trying to help them to make better choices. So when you're in charge of your life, you can feel empowered to make a better choice. So your suddenly and immediately does not become a consequence. It becomes a blessing. Amen? But Paul had to, for the first time, Paul had to be willing to listen to another voice. Paul's knowledge was no longer needed at this point. Hello? I don't care how smart you are, how many A's you've got. I was a triple A student. I was. Absent, absent, absent. <laughs> Doesn't matter how many A's I had. I had a lot of A's. The point is, God still used me. Now, I'm not saying be absent. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that was me. I was naughty. Naughty. Because I wouldn't listen. When the teacher's teaching me, I'm looking out the window, looking at girls. All I wanted to do was go and play football or chase girls around the playground. I, I wasn't born for school. School wasn't born for me. But at some point in my life, I had to listen and be taught. And God was very generous to me because my very first job, God put me next to an old man called Tony. And for three years, he schooled me on the factory floor and I was being paid for it. And he taught me all the nations of the world. He taught me all the currencies. He taught me maths. He taught me English all while I was working with him. And because I enjoyed what I was doing, because I enjoyed working with my hands, not with my head. If you give me instructions, I don't like reading them. Let me play with it. I'll work it out. Even now I'm like that. My wife says, just read the instructions. I say, no, no, let me play with it first. If I break it, then I'll, I, I, then I'll go to the instructions. <laughs> That's just my nature. To, I need things in my hand. So this guy taught me for three years. It was the best education I ever had inside the factory. It wasn't I couldn't be taught. It was about the environment. God knew if Paul was going to be taught, God had to get Paul on his own. And he had to make him blind. And he had to have a word with Paul and say, Paul, all that you think you know is about to change. There's going to be a suddenly, because when I open your eyes, son, what you think you know is all about to change. This is why God must touch your eyes. That's why Paul prayed, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The very guy who had this happen to him is now praying for you because he realised this is a significant step in your Christian journey. That the eyes of your heart need to be enlightened in order that you may know the hope. Does this make sense? So Paul is told for the first time, son, shut up, listen. 
And maybe some of you, for the first time, need to be told, be quiet. Listen. Pay attention. Man up. Does that translate man up? Maybe not, anyway. Then in verse 10, there were disciple. Verse 10, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. And now you see, the suddenly he's coming onto Ananias. It's like, da, 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 da. Ananias, you're the man. It's your time. It's like an I said, what, me, me? Go to Germany. Go to Paul. Go to prison. And you can imagine Ananias being told, son, you're going to have a prison ministry. <laughs> you're going to go and pray for people and open their eyes. And there he goes into that house. And you, I believe in, it, in this room today, there are Pauls and there are Ananiases. For every blind person out there, God needs an Ananias. Do you know that? And you might be the Paul, you might be the Ananias. However, you can still be the instrument in God's hands. So Ananias is told, just like Paul was, to get up and go and do what the Father of Heaven is now instructing you to do. You must know the voice of God when it calls you. And Nias didn't say, hang on, let me pray about this. I need to go and talk to my pastor and see if we get a witness together. The Lord says, hey, it's me. When I'm talking, you know it's me when I'm talking. So when Nias gets the word, he gets up and he does exactly what the Lord tells him to do. Now he is guided by the GP. I love the way God tells Paul to go to Straight Street. You know why Straight Street? You don't need a sat-nav to find Straight Street. You don't need a satellite GPS to find Straight Street. Why? Because it's straight. Do you know that street's still there today? It is. So here, here he goes. It's like saying, can you imagine if that would have been me and God said, go to Salzburg? I never would have found it. But he says, go to Straight Street and there you'll find a man called Paul. But then verse 15. But the Lord then says to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings before the people of Israel. Let me say this to you, young people and older people. God knows the fears that lives inside, live inside of you. God knows your limitations. God knows your containment. And yet, God knowing that still calls you and still believes in you. God knew that I was useless in school. God knew I was terrible at school. But because I listened, now... I can write books. I didn't say write in books, write books. Now I'm used to write materials. Now to run a school of discipleship, creating materials. Why? Because I, was, I allowed somebody to teach me. God's not phased by your limitations. God's not phased by your circumstances. God says, I'm the God who calls you. I'm the God who can equip you. But you must come under instruction. Oy. Now that's the deciding factor right there. Coming under instruction. It's very quiet in this Catholic church. <laughs> Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered in. That's what you must do. You must go to where God's telling you to go. You must prepare where God's telling you to prepare. And you must enter in. I said you must enter in. Whatever God is calling you to do, you must do it. You must enter in with all that you are. And then he placed his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, 
Or you can imagine him saying, bah, 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 Brother Saul. You're thinking, you're not going to kill me, are you? Paul's like, ah. Grasapa, grasapa. Where are you, Paul? Where are you? And Ananias just lays his hands on him. You can imagine Ananias feeling a bit scared, thinking, just check he's got no knives. Just check he doesn't come from Manchester. And he's not going to get me when I put my hands on him. And Ananias stretches forth his hands. And for the first time, Ananias begins to see that God can use him to bring a miracle into somebody else's life. What a beautiful feeling to know that God can use you to bring liberty and freedom to Israel's most feared man, Paul. This guy's persecuted and killed Christians for fun. And now here you are being the liberator of the, the city's biggest criminal. Paul was the mafia, the religious mafia of the day. And here God's saying, go to him, lay your hands on him. And he's going to, he's going to become like you and Ananias. He's going to become one of the boys. Hey, do you believe God can lead you to, one of, to those kind of people? He can. He can. So he went and laid his hands. And he did what he was being asked to do. And he got the result that he was hoping for. So I said it yesterday and I'll say it today. He was in the right place at the right time, doing the right things to the right people, getting the right result. That's called walking in the will of God. Right now, I am in the right place. I'm speaking to the right people. You are the best looking group of people I have spoken to today. <laughs> Pastor Kwame is going to speak to another good looking crowd later on. What you and I must understand and try and understand is that the word of God and the God of the word are the same person. The word of God and the God of his word is the same person. This is so important for us to understand. It's not God says one thing and does something different. God doesn't change his mind. He's not a hypocrite. He's not double-minded. The God, the word of God is the same God of his word. And you must know the word of God and you must know the God of his word. I'm going to keep saying this because you can see that's just gone chink, 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 right over your head. What is this? Everybody tell me, what is this? No, no. What is it? It's not a Bible. What is it? What do we call it? The word of God. Right? Some people say it's a Bible, so it's just a book. It's more than a book. If it's a book, it's no different than the Quran. But if it's the word of God, but who is it the word of God to? It's the word of God to you and me. But to somebody else outside, it's just a book. It's the word of God to my life. So, if I read, all things are possible to those who believe, that's the word of God. But I must know the God of his word. So if I say to Jack today, or Jack says to me, I will give you 10 lev at the break time. Should I take him at his word? Should I, be able to, should I trust him? I have no reason not to trust him. If he says, here's 10 lev, I will give it you in the break time. I have every reason to believe that he will make good on his word. Now once he gives me the 10 lev. I now know that Jack. And his word are the same person. Do you understand this? So now I can trust him. So if he says to me again tomorrow. I will give you 10 lev. What can I expect? I expect him because he did it the first time. He'll do it the second time. So now I know the word in Jack is honourable. I know Jack and his word and the word in Jack are the same person. Hello. 
Some of us only know the word of God, but we've not yet learned to know the God of his word. This is very important, young people. The one who speaks is the one who, who will supply. They're not two different people. Once you know him, you know that what he says is true. He will bring us suddenly. He will bring the immediately. Some of you have been praying for all kinds of things. But if you know the God of his word and you stand in faith, the God of his word will become the word of God in you. And then suddenly that which you've been seeking will suddenly, immediately turn up in your life. At a time you wasn't probably expecting it. I know this God. I know this God. And I know many of you know this God. Many of you have seen the God of his word and the word of God become one in your life. Hello? Can you see this? Where are we on time? We okay? Five minutes and we're out of here. I'll be like a Swiss train. Stay on track and deliver on time. Well, it doesn't matter how much time I've got. I don't need all that time. I just need to say what I say and then I'm finished. And I'll say it on time, in time. Because I'm a man of his word. So if I go over time now, you can't trust me. It's true. If I tell you I'll stay, I've got to stay. If I tell you one thing and do something else, I'm in trouble. So Paul, you keep me to time. I've lost where I am now. Okay. Are you still with me? Are you sure? Okay. Let me ask you some questions. I love it when, when the Bible talks to us about questions. I've been speaking in my own church about when the Bible asks us questions, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. The moment God asks you a question, he doesn't come looking for the answer. He comes looking, he comes to you to ask you a question so that you can see what he knows. He reveals to you what he already knows. So by asking you a question... You see then what he sees. So when Peter and uh, the guys were walking uh, through Caesarea Philippi, Jesus knew that the whole region was, was being used for different idols. He knew there was all kinds of deities in that area. So he says, who do, who do you say I am? Now he knows who he is. He knows who he is. But it's good to ask the people you're with. So they, know, they say they know the Torah, they know the law, but have they seen the Christ? Can they join the two together? Hello? Can you join the two together? So Jesus asked, him the question, asked them the question, who do people say I am? Now listen to these boys as the response. Listen to them. This is, you know when you're, when you're in trouble from your parents and they ask you, who did it? And you come up with all kinds of answers rather than just saying, it was me. Well, it kind of fell out my hand. It almost broke as it fell out of my hand. Did you do it? Well, let me explain. And your parents are saying, I just don't want the story. I just want to know, did you do it? Well, mum, it's like this. It's not like this. It's just yes or no. Then we'll deal with the consequences later. We'll discover where we're going to shoot you and bury you next. <laughs> but let's just decide, did you do the crime? Because if you do the crime, you've got to do the time. <laughs> it's true. So they say, who do people say I am? Well, well, you know when someone says well. That means the thinking. Well, comma, uh, let me have a think. Uh, some say that you're John the Baptist. Okay. Some say, okay. What about you? Well, others say 
your Elijah. And go, okay. And what about you? Still others say you could be Jeremiah the prophet. It's like Jesus saying, can we just get to the truth? Who do you say that I am? Well, there is no well. Just answer the question. And then brave Peter's thinking, shall I go? Is this my time? Is it my time to say who he really is and answer the question? You're the Christ. You're the son, the living and the God. And it's like Peter, God says to Peter, well done, Pete. Well done. You saved these boys. We've been waiting for you, Pete. Well done. Because at that point, he now sees He's now got the light and he's now got the word because Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. You've now seen something and heard something that these dead legs have not yet seen. So you can be in the crowd who's seen things, who know things, but don't know or not seen what you've seen. Hello? It's quite possible to be... In a crowd that don't know what you know and have not touched what you've touched and are not going in the same direction you're going in. So Paul, let me finish this story quickly because I don't want to be on the train too long. Paul and young people, this is the challenge I feel the Lord would say to you this morning. Paul had to go and lie in that house and wait until God would send Another person. He didn't know it would be Ananias. And Ananias didn't know he was going to go and speak to a Paul. There are people you don't know. God's already lined up that God's got for you to go and speak. God's already got them lined up right now. And they're waiting. They're blind. And they're waiting for you to go and go to that house on Straight Street. Whatever your Straight Street is. God's waiting for you to become an Ananias, to listen to the word, take the challenge to go into all the world, preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, raise the dead, cast demons out. God's waiting for you because there is many, many Pauls out there that if you can just touch them, they can become significant men and women on the earth, just like you are. Because Paul and Ananias were, were batting for the same team. They were playing for the same team. It was called heaven. But here's the thing, are you willing to put your hands out and be led and be instructed? When Paul was blind, the first thing he did was, God, can you stand up, please? The first, whoops, sorry. The first thing he did, be blind for me, just put your hands out. Put, he's blind, he can't see. So many Christians are still blind when it comes to their destiny. But unless you can put your hand in somebody like a pastor, a leader, who can then na help you navigate. Navigate. All he has to do is hold on and trust. So put your hands on my shoulders. Hey, hey, don't take my wallet. <laughs> All we have to do is we keep walking together. And the more we keep walking, slowly his sight will become clearer and clearer and clearer. <laughs> right? Come here. In the name of Jesus, you now won't. And then what happens? Come here, I'm not finished. Come here. Now you can see, go and get somebody else and take them to the journey. Jack, that's a good man. Now all he has to, Jack has to do now, now he's gone, he's become the Ananias, now Paul has risen. I was the Ananias, now Paul's risen, now Paul has, puts his hands out and he's willing to lead another, navigate, and, and so it continues. This is why we must walk in righteousness. Thanks, guys. So, let me conclude. Is there any Ananiases in this room? Any fears in this room? Is there any fear? It's all gone quiet in this Catholic church. You said you're all Ananiases, but Ananias was full of fear, but he also had obedience. He was willing to work beyond his fear and be obedient to the God of his word. So is there any analysis here this morning? Is there any fear about going beyond the wall? Just stand to our feet. Come on. Let's just deal with it right now quickly. Listen, those who are standing up and saying, I have fear, Lord. 
I bless you in the name of Jesus because you had the courage to stand up and say, yeah, I feel like that. Bless you for doing that. May the Lord bless you for being honest with yourself. Because we all want to, we all want to feel we're like Paul. I'm going to be the apostle for the day. But the truth is we're more like Ananias. We're more like Ananias. Ananias. 